so I'm Jesper. Um, yeah, and today we're going to talk about what we are doing every day in Code Lounge. Um, Andrea already touched on a topic about our processes, how we're using GitLab, how we're developing. And today I wanted to talk a bit about more about how the technical setup we are we have um, and so on. Okay. Um, so as I said, we are in Code Launch exists almost for four years now. Um, but although we are here in the Software Institute, most of our projects are uh, not to, together with any other groups. And we have uh, doing mostly yeah, other projects. And so what are we actually doing? Um, so this talk, we're going to talk about how we're building software, um, how we are want to improve the way we're building software, and also wanted to touch on this topic about software research and how this could apply to the things we're doing. Um, yeah, so we know a little bit software engineering, uh, but uh, we have, uh, yeah, all of you also know a lot. Uh, so therefore I asked this question, so I was a bit curious about that. Um, and then, yeah, so we will see in the end a little bit about this topic. Um, this is the Code Launch team. As you can see, it's quite big. Um, yeah, with 10 people now. Um, but today, I'm not going to talk about what all these people are doing. I'm uh, going to focus on uh, the, what the developer team are doing. And this is this is us, Andrea, David, and me, Valerie, Alan, and Francesco. Um, yes. So. Overall, here is uh, some numbers about our infrastructure. So we have about 20 machines that we're managing, virtual machines and some, some uh, real machines too. Uh, we have around 50 services deployed, uh, yeah, in about 100 uh, containers. Uh, regarding the code, uh, yeah, so we have around 200 repositories. Um, not all of them are active, but through the through these four years, we have uh, yeah, created 400, 200 repositories or more. Uh, overall, it's about more than a million lines of code, and these are the languages we use. So you can see TypeScript is on the top. Uh, we actually rank. We try to somehow calculate how many lines of code and and uh, and so on. So TypeScript came on top, then we have Scala, JavaScript, Java, Python, Kotlin, Swift, and, and Ruby. Um, but this also is not only the code uh, that we as developers have done, but it also includes code from students that we have supervised because they are also on our uh, post-code post repository management system. Okay, so uh, regarding the infrastructure, um, this is Dev. Let me introduce you to Dev. This is our main machine, um, and this is the most important part of our infrastructure. It's a physical server down here in the in the cellar of this building. Uh, we use Docker heavily. Everything basically is Dockerized. Um, also, here worth to note is that basically all the services we use, or all the products we use, are all I think most of them, if not all, are open source and free. Uh, the only thing we pay a little bit for is uh, SolarCube. Um, and we have this basic setup. We have a reverse proxy from uh, using the Nginx, basically it's in front, and then we have all the, the Docker containers behind. So the reverse proxy will reroute all the requests to the appropriate container. Um, and then we have uh, GitLab, which is our core core service, let's say, for all the things we do. Um, it is used to manage all our projects. It's also used for continuous integration, continuous deployment. And for, their, for that reason, we have these GitLab uh, runners. Uh, then we also have a, 
Um, yeah, Sonar Cube we mentioned uh, for the quality assurance to make sure yeah we don't make some stupid mistakes and we are on top of our goals. Um, then we also have uh, this year we added a renovated bot, which is a, let's say it's a service that makes sure that all the dependencies because we have ongoing projects, some maybe we don't actively maintain. But with the renovated bot, it will check all if there are any updates or critical updates, and then we get it automatically creates a merge request, and then it runs the pipeline, and then we can see if we can integrate that easily, and we can make a decision to do that. So we don't have to always check did we get is the new version released of this and that. Um, then we have Isinga, which is also a very important tool. Uh, which is our monitoring system. Uh, this we monitor machines, we can monitor services, websites, uh, also the hardware resources. So we always know if something is down or you know, we, uh, some, you know, when one machine is exploding or something, we have a notification in Discord. So, so this uh, has been working well. Uh, this also, I mean, this is something we actively are working on. Uh, so this is one machine, but then we have all the other machines too. Um, and they are basically the same structure as always an Nginx reverse proxy and everything containerized. Um, yeah, but this year then, so this is a bit what I want to talk about more is about, uh, we have been working on standardizing uh, how we are managing these machines and how we're deploying and how to, we're trying to automate this as much as possible. Um, so now we have basically a system where we can uh, deploy directly from the merge request. So uh, yeah, the star of this show is uh, GitLab, as mentioned. Uh, this is the all what you need platform for DevOps. Um, and one of the main features of GitLab is the or the CI and CD things it provides. Uh, yeah, on the funny side note, I mean, now it has been growing quite big GitLab. When we started it four years ago, it was very small, but now just recently did an IPO. Now Goldman Sachs is using it, and uh, even the European Space Agency. So it's really become a, a big tool. Um, yeah, so how do we? do that with the continuous delivery. So this is a typical uh, project we have. Uh, these are Docker, different Docker containers. We manage with the Docker Compose file. And we have the reverse proxy again, usually uh, some kind of front end, the back end, and the database, and then we have some kind of authentication uh, service. Um, yeah. And then we, uh, what, how it works is on uh, uh, in GitLab for each project we have a, a CI configuration. This year we worked uh, on standardizing that, so we have basically one template that we can reuse across all all our projects. And with that template, we have three environments. We have the review environment where we can deploy directly from a merge request. So that we can verify that uh, yeah everything works. Then we have the staging where we use yeah basically to integrate these different services to make sure they work uh, work well together. And then we have the production where we can yeah deploy to wherever the production machine is. So a typical pipeline looks like this. Uh, we have. First, we do install all the dependencies. We have a linter checking. We have run the test. We do quality assurance with Sonar Cube. Up and only after that, we build. And then we release. And release in this case is usually building the Docker image, putting it in a registry. And then we deploy that. And this, yeah, uh, takes a little bit of time, but uh, yeah, it works well, very well now. Um, yes. And here uh, is our typical tech stack, maybe it's also interesting. Um, 
So in the front and in the last talk I had, we spoke about the TypeScript and React. So we're still using TypeScript and React. I mean, a lot of things have happened. So I um, mean, it seems it was the right choice because everybody is moving to TypeScript. We have um, the framework for it. It's called Next.js to yeah to set up the this we always have to have a kind of a server for the front end. So we use Next.js there to structure the code and so on. Uh, for routing and so on. And then we have the UI libraries, the material UI. Uh, and then on the back end, basically, we have two stacks. One is uh, on the KVM, so we're using Kotlin and Spring Boot. And another is on Node.js uh, with TypeScript and SJS. And how, yeah. And we use to communicate with the back end front end, we basically always use uh, GraphQL now. Uh, this has a benefit since we use TypeScript in the front end. Basically, all the types we, I mean, all the requests we do using GraphQL, we can generate the types. This is a, a big time saver. Also, it's easily to detect if there makes some changes in the back end. Very easy to see what has changed. Um, yeah, for data store, we usually use Postgres for, uh, yeah. For relational database, that's very solid. And then authentication is something we started this year. In the past, we have been doing ourselves, uh, but now we found a survey for a uh, project from Red Hat called Keycloak, which basically provides all the authentication that the service is uh, it's actually working uh, very well. That's that we're using. Um, yeah. So I mentioned a little bit about uh, what we've been doing. So this year we've been working a little bit extra on establishing some of these processes, how we're developing, what Andrea talked about. Um, so the goal here has been about sharing our experiences, because often we work uh, a little bit on, we have multiple projects going on, and we want to share you know, what we learn about different technologies and so on, and also to make it every project is more standardized, meaning that so we can have a high quality. And now, uh, well, actually this year we had three people to onboard uh, since January. And uh, there's also a way to get easy on board, uh, do the onboarding more easy. Another thing what we do is uh, Slack projects. Uh, yeah, maybe it looks like this, but most of what we're doing are uh, things we are interested in uh, personally, so it could be to try, um, you know, try some new technologies, or we want to make uh, contribute to some open source project. Um, yeah, we have tried in different ways. We tried, we have been doing it sometimes in weeks, like all together in a week, but then maybe it takes you know, two, three months before we can do it the next time. So now we're back on. So every Friday we are doing working on this. And this basically is our playground. Um, yeah, and uh, as I said, the, the way for us to work on interesting products. Okay, so um, now come here. So we have talked about this, but of course there are many things we would like to improve to make things easy. Um, and to do that, the main focus for us is uh, about automation. So many things we, I mean, now we have automated certain things like deployment and so on, because uh, I mean, it's not that we just have one product, we often have several ongoing projects and then it becomes very tedious to always do the same thing all the time. And uh, you know, I don't know, they say developers are lazy, so we just want to do the thing, one, do the thing once and then it should be done. So some of the things we're looking into are um, these. Uh, one thing that we have been tried out before is to have a Kubernetes cluster for even easier to deploy so that we don't have to have virtual machines for everything. Uh, yeah, we have <laughs> tried it with, uh, uh, with the university 
it didn't really work out. So let's see maybe uh, something more in the future. It's a little bit, it's a lot actually to, uh, to manage. So uh, you basically need somebody who manages that for you. And then another thing, since we have so many virtual machines or machines, we want to, to try to set up a single sign-on on SSH. Uh, using Keycloak, I mentioned before, so that we have one user and then whenever we have a VM, we can just integrate it there and then we can, you know, we always have the same users because we, uh, we are always, all of us should have access to these machines. And this is also maybe related to the last one, it's called as in infrastructure. Mm, yeah, we haven't tried that, but we are a bit excited to try that. Basically, where you can define your uh, yeah, your machines in, in, in code, and that you can automatically deploy. Yeah. So these are some of the things what, what we're looking for. Um, yeah, so then we have this other part uh, about applying software engineering research. Uh, it's not something we like to discuss all the time, uh, but for me, I find it very interesting because uh, I know, especially, I mean, we are in the Software Institute. There's a lot of uh, good research being done here. And so is there something we can learn from this? Like, is there some tools that are available that can help us to improve, you know, the way we are doing software? Um, I think also, I mean, as part of a cold launch, we're somehow in between academia and industry. So it would be, uh, yeah, being part of the uh, academic institution would be good to, to try and apply these, uh, these tools and to be in the forefront in that regard. Um, however, I found it quite difficult actually to find, uh, yeah, software engineering research that we can apply. Most of the time, it is uh, you know, there is a paper and it works in the paper, but then in our situation, it's a bit, uh, bit different. Uh, for now, what we use uh, is uh, Sonar Cube, which has uh, yeah, the basis in software engineering research. So, therefore, I ask this question. So, uh, you can see here, uh, it was, uh, yeah, on purpose, it was a little bit uh, vague. So I didn't want. So I want, was a bit curious to see what, what could come out. So the question was, which developer tools do you know that originated in software engineering research and that are actively maintained? Um, so we got 13 responses, and uh, here we have 20 tools. Um, I put this together here. Uh, now I just sorted them by stars. So we have some to infer, and that has the most, uh, yeah, most stars, 12,800. And the LLPM, Copilot Tools, 11,000. Copilot, also here, 6,400. Tora Cube, as I mentioned, 6,300. And then we have the Check the framework, Faro, and so on. Not, I mean, these stars are, if it's open source, for most, some of these folks, I couldn't find the repository or the stars. So they're a bit, uh, bit yeah, they are here, although, I mean, Eclipse is widely used. So we just put them minus one to sort them. But uh, yeah. This was interesting. So we did, uh, so I was curious, I wanted to know also from us in Code Launch. So how many, for, because for me, most of these tools I've never heard of. Uh, so these, are these tools that you would actually like to use? So, um, so I asked in the, in the chat and then we had, so I asked, uh, Okay, put the thumbs up if you would like to use the tool, thumbs down if you know I don't think this we should use, or you know the shrug if you you never heard about this or you don't know. So uh, yeah, and this is the result. Uh, so you can see, except SonarCube, okay, we are using that, so everybody knows knows about it. 
co-pilot everybody uh, knows about, but interesting enough, not everyone was interested to, to, to use it. Uh, and then you see most of the other things, well, on Faro we have uh, yeah, different opinions um, and so on. But uh, yes, most of the things are, uh, yeah, we can see it's hard for us to use or we have never heard about them. So uh, in this, uh, yeah, with this, uh, I mean, when I started this, I, I also tried to find some papers because I often hear like, oh, but uh, software engineering is often very, you know, academic and it's not uh, really, it's not so much applied uh, in the industry. Um, so I found this paper, very long paper, 68 pages or something. Uh, but it's called Practical Relevance of Software Engineering Research and then Synthesizing Communities Voice. So they did some study about trying to, they went back in history, they looked in different, uh, not only software engineering, they looked in other fields, uh, like also I think in medicine, social sciences, and, uh, in management and so on. Uh, you know why? Why? Why is this gap? You know why is the? You know there are not so many academics going to you know developer conferences and the other way around, and you know there's not so much uh, exchange. Uh, so this is more like a philosophical uh, question, uh, but they came up with uh, some uh, root causes based on that. Um, so the first one is researchers have simplistic views so wrong assumptions about software engineering in the practice. Two, the lack of connection with the industry. Or three, the wrong identification of the research problems. And to end the, on the solution side or the suggestions they had or they came up with. Uh, one was using appropriate research approaches such as action research. Uh, two, choosing relevant research problems and three, collaborating with industry. So, and this brings me to the last part, uh, which is one, uh, it's about the, the tool we have been working on, which is called the uh, TACO. So this, let me say, say this is the, yeah, what I think I mentioned in the in the beginning about being this uh, bridge between industry and academia. So basically, here we took some uh, research done in the reveal group, um, specifically from Roberto, um, about uh, you know in the IDE. This is about how uh, how we, how we are uh, coding, let's say. Um, and we had a hack week to pick this up, and now it's on 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 VS Code as an extension. Uh, we also have, I mean, there was a challenge uh, put up by Andrea to make it into, into a conference, uh, like to use the data to come up uh, uh, with uh, interesting insights from some of the data we have produced with this tool. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so far it has been this still in uh, in early stages, and, uh, but uh, it's uh, actually pretty cool, and it's something you can just download and install in your IDE, and you can see how you, you know, which part of the code you have been touching in certain sessions, uh, and so on. In the time interval when you have been more active, and so on. Okay, uh, so with that, I wrap up. Um, and so we talked about today about how how do we build the software in Code Launch? What are the things we would like to improve? And if there's some search uh, software engineering research that we could apply. Okay, and okay. Uh, thank you.